Hey friends. So what you're about to listen to is a raw, unscripted response to the death of George Floyd and the global attention to racial inequality in our country that this tragedy sparked. Now normally, when Brie and I sit down to record an episode, we chat for a few minutes, decide what we want to talk about, and then we record. Really, to keep it authentic, we barely prepare. And honestly, we didn't set out to make this an entire episode. But once we got started talking, we knew this was too important. So after we recorded, we agreed to listen to the episode separately and decide if it was worth sharing or if we should just keep this as our own personal documentation. After reviewing it, we both felt that in our rawness, we stumbled a bit. This was our response, and we gave ourselves permission to fail forward. After much consideration, we decided that we should release this episode, our emotionally charged response. But it needed to start with this reflection. This work, both individually and collectively, is ongoing. And if we don't do the thinking out loud, the conversation gets very quiet until the next tragic event. When Lainey and I came back together after listening, we realized a difference in how we respond in the now versus reflecting after time. Similar to Monday morning quarterbacks, right? It's just usually clearer after the fact. Response is reactionary. It's stream of consciousness. It's almost instinctual to our present state of mind and stress. Dialogue is literally our brain making meaning on the fly. Our brain search to connect experiences and terms with stories, memories, and concepts, grasping at these familiar phrases and then trying them on as new ideas. Reflection is determining the fit. Did that word best describe the situation? Did I misunderstand something and therefore my mistake caused me to wrongfully accuse? Did the mix of patterns of my outfit accentuate my features or did it really just draw attention to all the things I'd rather not show? Reflection is sizing up our attempts, acknowledging the failures, learning what, where, and why changes should be made, and then revising to improve. Reflection isn't retraction, it isn't removing, it isn't erasing or editing. And Bree, I really appreciate what you said there, and I I appreciate the reflection isn't retraction. But I I did say some things in in my response during our recording, and in my reflection, I have some thoughts that I want to share. So first of all, when I start the conversation that you're about to hear, I don't even know how to articulate what's going on. And I use the word sad, but I don't explain what is sad. To be clear, I'm not worried about my sadness. It is the racial inequality in our country that is sad, and sad isn't a strong enough word. I also say with the passing of George Floyd, this is a tragic death, and the word passing was a poor choice. Another thing, in the beginning I say, I would like to think that I am an aware person and I am evolved. To be clear, I am evolving, not evolved. I still have a lot of work to do. And then later in the conversation, I get emotional when I'm thanking you, Brie, for your work, uh, for all your involvement in this conversation and your work on equity. There are a lot of emotions right now, and I truly am inspired by Brie's work, but I don't want my response to come off as a focus on how white people are impacted by racial inequality. That is not my intent. Lainey, thank you for sharing your reflections and for your vulnerability. Um, We're always worried that we're saying the wrong things. And in fact, it's that very fear that often keeps us silent and from saying anything at all. I do my best to stay involved in this conversation, um, but in no way do I consider myself an expert. I continually worry that I'll say the wrong thing. And in fact, I do quite often um, and am continually asking for grace in my processes. Um, So That said, we hope that you'll stay with us through this entire episode. We stay committed to sharing ideas to make learning better for all. While we certainly don't have all the answers, at the end, we do discuss the importance of honoring the work of culturally responsive teaching and our responsibilities as parents and educators to infuse diverse and positive representations of people through literacy, curriculum, and social presence. It takes all the ingredients, right? We're gonna take everything that's happening right now, we're gonna mix them together, taste it, and adjust for flavor. Reflection is lemonade. It's learning, it's lemonade learning. Hey, I'm Brianna Hodges. And I'm Lainey Rao, welcome. Um, So in honoring our raw documentation as educators and parents, we want to be really transparent about what's happening as we're, we're recording this episode. So, 
Um, it's very sad to us. Um, with the passing of George Floyd, there is a lot going on. There are a lot of conversations being had. And we're going to try and just share a little bit about what our thinking is as parents and educators. And I, I really want to defer to you, Brie, at this moment, because I'll be totally honest, um, as, as much as I would like to think that I am an aware person and I'm evolved, I have not done the work on equity that you have. And so I want to just kind of know, what are you thinking right now? Well, thank you. Um, I don't, you know, self-profess to do, uh, to, to have any real answers or, or to even really, you know, be in a place where um, I should be speaking on any, you know, authority by any stretch of the imagination. But um, we are, we're in this very difficult situation right now. And um, it's one that has been happening for hundreds of years and um, one that, that many of us have willfully turned away from and not, you know, um, given the, the uh, platform and the, the credence and the, um, the, the willfulness to change that we, that we absolutely should do. So um, I think that we're, we're just in this really raw spot right now. Um, I'm, I, I can speak for myself and say, you know, um, as a, as a person, who lives in the South and I am, am quote unquote very far removed from a lot of the things that we're seeing around. Um, that said, that doesn't mean that it's not happening here within my, my own place. And so, um, that's something that, you know, we're certainly having conversations with my, with our kids and, and with, um, you know, how does that play out, uh, for their friends at home and in school and, and all these different pieces. So, you know, for me personally, we are definitely having a lot of conversations. Um, I'm very fortunate and blessed to be in, um, several groups where I get to hear from, um, you know, firsthand uh, from from people of color who are you know, really processing, dealing with, you know, grieving, mourning, um, fearing, you know, all of the things that are that are really just part of this. And um, I think for me personally, the most important thing that we can do is um, number one, I see you, and I I um, I'm uh, I'm so sorry that others have not seen you before, and um, and that I hear you, and I am listening. I'm leaning in and listening to what is happening. Um, that said, once we you know are at that point where we can lean in and we can listen, then what are we going to do next? And so um, definitely have done my fair share of reading and learning and um, trying to get my hands on as much information first person as well as through books and just documentation after documentation of, of all of these things to then figure out where I'm, uh, you know, where can I lean into this? Um, you know, for a long, long, long time, I was like, I haven't done these things to other people. So how is this my fault? And, um, you know, there's a lot of power in words and responsibility and accountability are very different things. I might not have been responsible for something that happened, but I'm certainly accountable for it. And so what are the things that I can do moving forward to amplify others who have been um, marginalized, removed, shunned, um, prohibited from the opportunities that I, um, that I have had or that, that other people around me have had. And so, you know, really just kind of taking, you know, I know that you and I have spent a lot of time talking about auditing and reflecting. And um, I think that that's where we all are in this personal, or, you know, this point in time in our, in our personal responses to this is auditing what it is that um, has happened in our lives that we can change um, to, to make someone else's life better. Um, it's not just about our, our situation. It's not just about our kids. It's about a lot of other people out there. And so, um, you know, I think that that's kind of where I sit at this particular section of time, but um, it's, it's, it's really hard. And I will definitely say, you know, I think too, and then, you know, let's, let's jump into some of this conversation. I think one of the other parts to be really, really honest and, and very transparent is, you know, we're all so afraid to say the wrong thing. <sighs> and, um, and I think that, that we need to take that collective breath and know that we're going to say the wrong thing yeah. because a lot of wrong things have happened. And we personally know what we have experienced 
but we can't, while we can empathize with others, we can't actually know what it has been like for others in those situations. And so that's where it becomes super, super, super important for us to have communication, for us to be able to hear those stories and put ourselves in the, the metaphorical shoes, right? Of if that were our son, if that were our brother, if that were our father, what would it look like for us? And the, the um, you know, if I was the mom, how would I feel going into that? Um, that said, you know, there's, like I said, there's, there's no right response in this. No one owns this issue. No one owns the solution to it. It's going to take all of us. And um, there, I am quite certain that I, specifically I will mess it up along the way. I know that I've ha- that I have, and I know that it's going to take, you know, making those mistakes failing forward with it and, um, you know, really relying on a lot of other people to, um, to help me be better. And, and that's kind of been our thing through this whole piece is being better together and, and, you know, listening to those voices and, and, and helping create a composite um, representation of, of where we need to move forward with it. Yeah. And I think, you know, you and I've had discussions and I I love what you said about staying true to our values and we're going to do the best that we can. And yes, we will fail in particular me and, and, and we, we just want to be the best parents and educators that we can to help make things better for everyone. And so we're going to work on it. It's not a one and done. Um, often events happen that, that spark the conversation, but the real change happens when this is a continuous conversation, when we're continuously improving. And so we know there's been a lot of work out there. It's time to really take a closer look at the work that has been happening and bring that into the spotlight and continue that as we move forward. And I think, I think I, I know we can do this and we are definitely better together doing it. I, I think I think that's so important. I mean, that's the crux of being a learner, right? Is is taking the events that are happening and looking at both the past as well as our hope for the future, and where do we want to make things better? And and um, you know, I, I love that you said that. There there are there's so much work out there that has been done, and um, you know, it's it's our opportunity to learn about that work and to infuse it in such a more um, deliberate and intentional way to make sure that we're really getting, um, you know, we're really getting where we want to go. And, and I do think that, you know, it's, it's obvious you know, we're two white women yes. dealing with this, with this situation. Um, I don't necessarily think that that's, um, you know, it's, it's not something that, that needs to be, um, glanced over. I think that, you know, as, as white women, how do we handle this? How, what are the conversations that we're having? Um, you know, we often find ourselves in situations where, where white women and men are the majority voices in the classroom. And so how can we, you know, reconcile that and, and, you know, provide these opportunities. So I I do think that it's so important and I, you know, going back to those core values, how do we, you know, listen, get so much um, knowledge from so many other people. Um, You know, I'm, I'm a part of a group of 15 educators, well, 15 people from across the United States of all different kinds of, of backgrounds. And the majority of the people that are in that group are, are, are people of color. And um, it, it, it's, it's such an honor to be a part of that and to hear the experiences and how different they are from across the country. And some of them are, are, are immigrants who have, you know, come to, to the United States. And so then they bring their own experiences from their, their home countries to then come in. And, you know, it takes all of this information for us to really get to a point where we can, you know, learn together and, and learn individually as well as collectively. Well, I want to thank you and everyone that's on that panel. And I want us to put in the show notes for this, the, the links to that, because I know that's a really important conversation that's happening and it dives much deeper than what we're able to cover here. But this, I just want to really stress that this has to be an ongoing conversation. You know, there's been a lot of talk about social emotional learning more lately in the last maybe couple years than previous, maybe longer than that. But it's been a lot 
of SEL, SEL, but this is a constant conversation. These are just, this has to be woven throughout all of it as our role and our, as parents and educators, we have to be thinking about these things and how do we make good people who do the right thing and love each other. And so they got to work on it. You and I talked, you know, earlier that, um, you know, just like <laughs> the, the remote learning opportunity has really opened a lot of people's eyes outside of education to a lot of the inequities and discrepancies the, and disparities that are within our education system and the role that, um, that the role that schools and classes and teachers really play in the day-to-day -day lives of our students. Um, I think that that is a similar situation that we're starting to see in this um, because there are so many people that have been doing some incredibly powerful work along culturally responsive teaching and, and SEL and, you know, creating these equitable learning environments. And, and there's so much work that's been done and so much more work to be done. That said, um, it, it unfortunately takes a um, super, super heightened traumatic event like we've had that then um, spurs change. And I think that we're seeing some of that happen across the country is that people are now all of a sudden, um, you know, opening their eyes to to continued atrocities that have happened over and over and over again. But, uh, you know, the the, uh, the climactic event or the catalyst event of, of George Floyd's death, um, tragic death, is, is really you know, spurring this, okay, we, we need this in our, in, our, um, in our education settings for sure. So, you know, one of the things that, that we've been talking through is, you know, it doesn't have to be all about, you don't, you don't have to be in a race studies class in order to talk about um, some of these things any more than you have to be in a technology class to discuss technology, you know, and so I think that um, that's where we're kind of seeing our, um, our part of this conversation um, for, for the intent of this podcast is, is how can we continue to weave SEL and culturally responsive techniques into, um, into the classroom? And, and neither one of us, you know, self-professed knowing all the answers, um, but, you know, making that commitment to, um, to bring it to the forefront of, of that. Because we know if our kids aren't supported, they're definitely not learning. Yeah. And Brie, I do want to just take a minute to, to say thank you because you are um, sometimes the only white person on a panel, mm -hmm. sometimes the only white person standing up and talking about this in the room. And I just think that your courage is so inspiring. And I was going to try not to get weepy again. I was crying last time. Um, oh, but I, I just, I just love you and thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being brave. And, um, we all have to continue the conversation. It cannot just be a few that are doing it. So thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you for all the people who are doing it of every color that are doing it. That's what we need. It all has to be us together. I, I thank you for that. I think that I, um, I would like to say a great big, huge thank you to the people who trust me with their stories. And I think that that is, um, you know, I, I, I know equity is, is the ultimate goal for all of us. Every single person wants to have their voice heard. Every single person deserves to have their voice heard, whether they physically have a voice or not. Um, but having their, um, their life count for something and be, uh, you know, a part of the official record, if you will, is it's what every human being wants. It's what every, every being wants. And, um, and we can't get to equity if we don't have empathy and we can't get to empathy if we don't have the stories, if we don't know what's happening and we don't know, um, how important it is. And we don't hear that, um, from a trusted person in order to, to truly, you know, get all of that information, then we're never going to get to the other ones. And so, um, hearing these stories and then being able to, to advocate and amplify, um, is, is a huge honor for me. Um, and I'm grateful to countless people. I can't even begin to list all of them, but, um, uh, you know, I, I am grateful beyond, beyond measure for all of that. Uh. Okay, Bree. So I know we're, this is a very special episode. 
we're doing our very best to be honor, honoring things and respecting of people. And um, I do want to share one tip that kind of, that made my heart happy, um, but, but not just in a fluffy kind of happy way. Like it made me really think. Um, so I was on Twitter um, and uh, this, this woman, Christine Taylor Butler, um, I am a parent, author, and former college interviewer. Please hear me. In this time of stress, people want to flood their kids with books about racism. Please provide 20 joyful books for every one book on racism. They also need to know people of color, kids, are like every other kid. And I love that. I love that so much because I really do think that kind of the knee-jerk reaction to this is to... I know as a parent, like my first thought was, I need to be reading to my kids more about racism. But I, I do, that really resonated with me that we want a representation of everyone um, that is not just about racism. I'm not saying that well, but, but you know. I, so I'm going to jump in. I'm going to jump in on this because I absolutely love that you said that because I think that one of the things that is so important is I love that you use the word um, representation, right? And I think that that's where it's so, so, so important. If we pause and we say, oh, okay, well, um, we, you know, we had Black History Month in February, so check, we're done with that. Or, oh, we read Martin Luther King's um, I Have a Dream speech, so check, we're done with that. Or, you know, we spend all of our time talking about, you know, Martin Luther King's letter to, from a Birmingham jail or Malcolm X or, you know, um, all of these different pieces that, um, that, that we have isolated as representations of people of color and, and what they mean in our society. And um, oftentimes what that comes across as is that, okay, number one, um, we feel like we've checked the box and that we have you know, learned all that we can from that. And I don't think that that's really true. Um, I think that we also have a tendency to represent um, African Americans as um, as as protesters or as um, you know people who are going to to stand up against the cause no matter what. And we put people of color in this um, you know position of responsibility to tell us when they feel wronged. And um, what I mean by that is what are we as, as, as white educators, you know, implying whenever we do that? Instead, can't we say that just and have more representation of kids doing all kinds of kid things, right? Like it shouldn't, why is it that, you know, the, the representation of African Americans or of, of Black Americans or Blacks period in the classroom is always associated with a protest or, uh, you know, with something else? Why can't it be like this little book that I have here, you know, Stand Tall, um, Molly Lou Mellon, that is all about, you know, her hair and her, you know, different representations and, and what she looks like or how come it can't be, you know, this one from Karen Beaumont that says, I like myself. And it's a fun story about how different, you know, there's no one else I'd rather be. These are joyful representations of people that don't look like you and I. Yeah. And I think that that is really, really important. We don't see enough of that. You know, I mean, I grew up when the Cosby show was the only black TV show, right? I grew up when Sanford and Sons was the only black TV show. And, you know, when you have one of those, one of the quote unquote black TV shows and 45, you know, I'm making up numbers at this point, yeah. but that are, that are representing everyday life in other forms, you're, you're, normal and quote unquote, and your average gets really skewed. And so, you know, what are we saying to those people of color, to those kids of color that are sitting in our classrooms if they don't see it any other way? So um, I love that you shared that. And I, I think that that's really, really important. I would ask, you know, our, our viewers and our, um, our listeners out there, what are your favorite books that represent, um, you know, all kinds of people and um, how can we incorporate those? So, so tell us, not just the ones that are, are politically charged or that are activist related. Um, those are important too. We're not saying that they're not, but what are those everyday lives that put people of color and um, of different uh, you know, circumstances in that power situation? 
Yeah. And we haven't talked about it today so much, but, you know, equity, there's, that's a big conversation. It's not even just about race, but today we're focusing on that because that is a very important conversation to be had, but not only today to keep moving forward. So as I'm processing this and I'm just thinking out loud and there's a lot of anxiety I'm having right now because I know I'm not saying it all perfectly, but I think the best thing that I can do is commit to continuing to learn and being kind to everyone and doing my very best to raise little people and to teach little people to be kind to everyone too. Yeah, I love it. I mean, I think it's, you know, that's our job as educators, right? Is, is to look at our situations, try to make, make meaning out of them and, um, and then find a way to, to improve the lives of others. And so mistakes are going to happen. I know I make them every single day in every single way. And I just hope that I have people around me who have enough grace for me and enough, um, you know, willingness in their heart to steer me back onto the, to the right path. So, um, here we go. That's, that's kind of the lemonade that we're, we're trying to make these days. Um, thanks for, for really sticking with us through a, uh, a very difficult conversation, um, but a very necessary conversation, the tip of the iceberg. Um, and you know, here we go trying to, process and, and do better tomorrow. Yes. And as always, we do appreciate you all listening to our raw documentation of our, our lives. And um, we're going to continue to, to add the suite and stay as positive as we can. But that, that also means paying attention to this and everything else that we need to be paying attention to as parents and educators. And we're going to keep doing our very best. And we hope, hope you guys will join us along the way. And please also consider sharing on social media. We, um, you know, Bree and I are big girls and we can, we can handle constructive criticism, but we do want to encourage everyone to be going forward with as much kindness, grace, and patience to each other as we can. Yeah. And again, I mean, I want to add in this last little pl plug to, to leave it, you know, on that positive note of, um, finding those positives, uh, again, not turning away from the hard, not turning away from the, the, the very real tragedies that are out there, but how do we um, create opportunity for everyone to be seen in a positive light um, and, and find those ways to, to bring that into our classroom and into our homes so that we can you know, really amplify those stories um, and, and make it our reality eventually. Um, you know, I think that that's a big part of it. Find that positive. How can we positively impact change and, and keep moving forward? Absolutely. Oh, thank you all for listening. Be well. Thanks, guys.